Pallavi Chakrabarti. Uh, this is, I think, great timing for the talk she's going to give, because if you were at the last meeting uh, on Thursday, the last seminar we had, uh, this was about how we live with nuclear risks and threats, where we had three sociologists who study that issue. And they really emphasized the dual use nature of nuclear technologies, looking at it the way it's most commonly looked at as a dichotomy between weapons and energy. But what we're gonna hear about today is a third important uh, dimension of this that is more often overlooked, which is the role of nuclear technologies for medicine. Uh, so to hear about this, we have the perfect speaker. Uh, Pallavi is uh, a staff member at Sandia National Laboratories, the campus they have just across the bay in Livermore, uh, where she supports the International Nuclear Radiological Security Program Office. Uh, she coordinates their international activities related to the security of radioactive materials, including those sources used for nuclear medicine. Uh, she was previously a U.S. National Nuclear Security Administration graduate fellow with the Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation Office's uh, Office of Radiological Security. So she's been focusing on these issues for quite some time. And she has a Master's of Science in Media Communication and Development from the London School of Economics. Uh, so without further ado, over to you. Great. Thank you, Cameron. And thanks to you all for joining me for this talk. I also want to give a special thank you to my mentor, Rod Ewing, uh, for the guidance and development in today's presentation. To get started, radiation sources are used widely in modern society. And it's a warning. I'll start that again. <laughs> uh, radiation sources are used widely in modern society. And its use in medicine is an application area that I've been particularly interested in learning about. There is a clear correlation between the use of radioactive sources and medical applications and its association with security concerns. And today, I'll be discussing this topic further with you all. We're all exposed to radiation every day, but only certain types of radiation, such as that from radioactive weapons and waste pose multiple risks. Because of the widespread use of these materials today, the risk of a radiological attack is very real. These concerns have been acknowledged and reflected upon during the Nuclear Security Summit process, a series of world summits aimed at preventing nuclear and radiological terrorism. United Nations organizations, such as the World Health Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency, have also made public statements regarding the use of these materials and continue to work with countries in managing their radioactive sources for use in medical applications. As such, these public statements do demonstrate the alarming fate of radioactive sources. These sources help fight cancer, but if they were to become abandoned, lost, stolen, or mixed into scrap metal, there could be dire consequences. As terrorist activities have evolved, so have the concerns about the security of radioactive sources. Two radioactive isotopes in particular, cesium-137 and cobalt-60, are widely used in medicine for treating cancer through radiation, irradiating blood, and sterilizing medical instruments. Alternative non-isotope-based technologies are also used in medicine and do not pose as a security risk. These alternatives, however, have been coined as advanced technologies that are difficult to sustain in challenging environments. Now, diving into the outline of my presentation, which I've divided into the following topi topical areas, and I hope they'll help address some of the intricacies that are involved in the use of isotope-based devices and the security and global health considerations at hand. I'd also like to mention a few common terms used when referring to radiation therapy devices and the associated treatment options. Radiation therapy is a type of cancer treatment that utilizes two device types. The source-based device emits gamma rays, while the non-source-based device delivers radiation via high-energy X-rays. Furthermore, there are two types of radiation therapies, internal and external radiation. I'll note that the focus of my presentation today will be external beam radiation therapy, which is delivered outside the body. 
The commonly used devices for external beam radiation are cobalt-60 devices and medical linear accelerators. Cancer is one of the world's largest health problems. Approximately 39.5% of men and women will be diagnosed with cancer at some point during their lifetimes. Radiation therapy remains an important component of cancer treatment with approximately 50% of all cancer patients receiving this therapy. As I mentioned, radiation therapy may take place with a source-based machine or a non-source-based machine. Depending on the type of cancer and its location in the body, treatment will either be provided externally or internally. For external beam radiation therapy, a beam of radiation is directed towards the tumor outside the body. Brachiotherapy or internal radiation therapy involves placing radioactive material in small amounts into the body where it may reside for protracted periods of time, providing localized doses to destroy a tumor. External beam radiation treatment is administered to patients via source-based and non-source-based machines, as I mentioned, which in turn involves the use of different radiation sources. The cobalt or cesium that's contained in these machines are encapsulated in a heavily shielded device and housed in a vault with concrete walls. Linear accelerators, on the other hand, require further shielding due to its higher energy levels. The diagram that you're seeing on the right demonstrates this treatment process with the patient being placed on a treatment table under a treatment head with the beam of radiation being pointed towards the tumor. And the tumor location in this particular diagram is in the lung. Radiation therapy is an impo important component of cancer care. However, access to this therapy is unequal throughout the world. In particular, low to middle income countries deal with a large burden of cancer compared to high income countries as there is inadequate or no access to radiation therapy. For reference, the World Bank defines low to middle income economies as those with a gross national income per capita of more than $1,045, but less than $4,125. This economic context helps us understand the resource constraints and complexities involved in the use of one technology over the other. What complicates this issue further is that the machines available in, a, in LMICs or low to middle income countries are usually cobalt 60 based source devices. As such, access to radiotherapy, especially advanced technologies such as linear accelerators is a major challenge. Even with the limited availability of linear accelerators, there are examples of linear accelerators that have been installed in parts of Africa, but do experience extended periods of downtime due to the failure of common parts of the machine. The process of repairing and then returning the parts to the manufacturer can be expensive and take time. As such, a Cobalt 60 unit is a simpler technology to operate and less expensive compared to a linear accelerator. So we talked a little bit about both technologies and what make their radiation sources different. Let's also talk about the isotope based device and its specific characteristics. These devices may contain cesium or cobalt and these isotopes are artificially produced gamma sources and are byproducts of nuclear reactor operations. It's formed when metal structures, such as steel rods, are exposed to neutron radiation. There are suppliers and manufacturers of these isotopes who will design and install devices as shown in this photo. This particular device shown here does contain a radioactive source, and that's located on the top of the device on the treatment head, where the radioactive material caution sign is displayed. Cobalt-60 devices are considered a clinically effective technology and cost-effective option in treating cancer. Nonetheless, there are other maintenance and life cycle costs involved in the use of such a machine. Given the fact that the Cobalt-60 source contained in the machine decays over time with a half-life of approximately 5.3 years, source exchanges are a separate cost of about $150,000 and should be factored in. 
An end user can expect multiple source replacements over the lifetime of the device. And if the sources are not being replaced every five or so years, patient treatment times continue to go up. Additionally, storage and disposal of the source must also be considered outside of the initial equipment costs. Linear accelerators have been used in cancer treatment for as long as its isotope-based counterpart. But in contrast, its technology and device design has advanced more rapidly. This device type does not contain gamma radiation source, but a radiation source which begins with an acceleration of electrons, where the electrons collide with a heavy metal target to produce high energy X-rays. Energy levels for linear accelerators can vary between low and high levels. Low energy linear accelerators at six mega electron volts are often used to target tumors of shallow doses or depths. High energy linear accelerators are chosen for deep seated tumors such as prostate cancer due to their higher penetration power and better skin sparing ability. Overall, while a linear accelerator is a more advanced technology, it requires more maintenance and a higher level of training for its operators, which also factors in to the higher costs throughout the life cycle of the machine. The linear accelerator displayed in this photo looks very similar to its source-based counterpart, but the mechanics of the machine operate very differently. There is an amplifier, an electron gun located at the back of the machine head, and then you'll find a waveguide for acceleration and then a bending magnet that attaches to the treatment head where the radiation is emitted. Radiation therapy is complex and both machine types have advanced to account for more complex treatment planning techniques. Today, these machines offer many capabilities which have increased abilities to conform dose to spare surrounding normal tissues during treatment. I wanted to particularly highlight the available capabilities row on this table and differentiate these machines and what make these options effective for modern radiotherapy treatment. You'll see that the available capabilities include 2D, 3D, IMRT, VMAT for both machines. These are known as imaging capabilities that differentiate both. There's two and three dimensional conformal radiotherapy, intensity modulated radiotherapy, which is IMRT, and then volumetric modulated arc therapy. These are recently developed imaging techniques and have become predominantly used in radiation therapy planning. But you'll notice for the non-source based option, there are some additional options such as SBRT and electrons, making it more advanced. SBRT is stereotactic body radiotherapy and is a type of radiation therapy that uses many beams of energy. The beams are carefully targeted to focus on tumors anywhere in the body. Separately, clinical electron beams are also a capability of a linear accelerator when they are configured into a ultra high dose rate electron mode known as flash where the target and flattening filter is replaced with an electron scattering foil. The flash effect is defined as improving normal, normal tissue sparing in radiation therapy where the dose rates are considerably higher. Now, based on these characteristics, while there are some similarities between both device types, the non-source based option is advanced in more ways than one. There is a direct health and security nexus with the use of source-based devices as they are concentrated in parts of the world with unequal access to cancer care and also vulnerable to security risks. In particular, the concern with the use of an isotope such as cobalt-60 is that when this material is improperly disposed, lost, or stolen, it can be developed as a weapon known as a dirty bomb. Using a conventional explosion, to disperse radioactive contaminants. The risk of this material being improperly disposed of can take place anywhere in the world. But if it were to take place in parts of the world vulnerable to terrorist activity, the risks are even greater. Historically, radioactive sources have been lost, stolen, and illegally discarded. And these examples here dem demonstrate a few of those instances. Beginning with this incident in 1987, 
1987, a theft incident took place in Goiania, Brazil, where scavengers combed through an abandoned clinic and found a radiation therapy source and the canister that contained the cesium radiation source was taken and handled by many people. As a result, there was radiation exposure where four deaths took place and the contamination of about 250 people. In 2003, evidence was found by British officials regarding the terrorist network Al-Qaeda success successfully building a crude radiological device or dirty bomb based on documents that showed that members had built a small device near Herat in Western Afghanistan. In 2007, seven men were arrested in connection with planning radiological attacks that were part of a group headed by senior Al-Qaeda operative Biren Barot. These plots included causing buildings to collapse in the US and UK by detonating limousines packed with explosives and to explode a radiation bomb that would have caused fear, panic, and widespread disruption. And then lastly, this example from 2013. An incident occurred when a truck was carrying a radiotherapy source in a container from a hospital to a waste storage facility, and it was stolen. The thieves removed the material from its case and were exposed to dangerous levels of radiation. It was later found that even then, anyone exposed to the material could have been severely impacted due to the exposure. The September 11th, 2001 terror attacks also demonstrated how weapons could now come in different forms, including the possibility of being developed from radioactive materials found in devices throughout the world. The vulnerability was very real, and there were heightened concerns regarding mass disruptions that could be created with the development of a radiological dispersal device. Even prior to the September 11th attacks, the International Atomic Energy Agency convened a conference in 1998 to talk about this very topic and the associated concerns with the use of this material. At the time, the IEA had started encouraging all governments to take steps in ensuring the security of radio radiation sources. That conference also helped move the development of an action plan, which covered seven major work areas, one of which identified the need for a system of source categorization. This resulted in the IAEA technical document on the categorization, categorization of radiation sources, published in December 2000 and provided a useful system and continues to do so today in categorizing radioactive sources, such as the sources contained in cobalt-60 radiotherapy devices. This image from the IAEA demonstrates the rather complicated web of available radiation therapy devices in the world. The countries highlighted in green are labeled as having adequate access to radiotherapy machines, while the countries highlighted in red orange and shades of yellow have the lowest availabilities of radiotherapy devices per million. What this image doesn't show are the types of devices available throughout the world. According to a recent medical physics journal article, there are about 1,766 cobalt teletherapy units available globally, and the majority of those machines are located in developing countries. Now, even though there are linear accelerators and advanced technologies that have been installed in countries like South Africa, Egypt, Morocco, and Tunisia, to just name a few, they are still few and far between in being able to meet the radiotherapy demands in those areas. In efforts to improve these radiotherapy statistics, the IAEA announced an initiative in 2022 called Rays of Hope to support member states with diagnosis and treatment using radiation technologies, beginning with African countries most in need. The initiative contributes to the fulfillment of one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals contained in the 2030 Agenda on Good Health and Wellbeing, and specifically pertains to Indicator 3.4 to reduce premature mortality from non-communicable diseases by one third. The initiative is focused on forging new partnerships and tapping into diverse funding sources, including from governments, international financing institutions, and the private, private sector to ensure maximum reach. 
through a sharp focus on countries without radiotherapy or with inequitable access, Rays of Hope focuses on prioritizing a limited number of high impact, cost effective and sustainable interventions in line with national cancer needs and commitment. Kenya will be one of the country recipients of two linear accelerators, which will help centers in the country treat more patients. In addition, technical reports such as this one from the World Institute for Nuclear Security, an international non-governmental organization based in Vienna, Austria, helps demystify source-based and non-source-based technologies, as well as its impact on operations and security. The report also discusses the necessity of involving key stakeholders across disciplines in understanding the role radiation source-based devices play in a particular application area. This report in particular highlights the use of cobalt devices and linear accelerators and asks end users to make their own ass assessment of which technology will work effectively in their specific situation. Furthermore, the IAEA has also published technical guidance in order to support member state capabilities. In 2004, the IAEA created guidance for securing these sources and released its code of conduct on the safety and security of radioactive sources, followed in 2011 by its guidance on the import and export of radioactive sources. These guidance documents provide further guidance regarding the establishment of a national policy and strategy for the management of disused sources or sources that are no longer in use and highlights the implementation and management options such as recycling, long-term storage pending disposal or return to supplier options. However, there are challenges when the intended use of cobalt-60 radiotherapy devices are complete and disposal must be determined as they require isolation for hundreds to thousands of years given the half-lives of certain isotopes. This, IAE, this IAEA paper from 2001 is an example of a perspective from a regulatory body expressing how countries do not have the necessary laws, interagency coordination, or resources in dealing with the disposal of low-level radioactive waste and how these materials must be placed in an interim storage facility. As a result, radioactive materials remain notably vulnerable to use by violent groups because they are awaiting permanent disposal. A caveat to also mention is that radioactive material can also be transported in different ways after it becomes disused or no longer in use. And during that process, special packaging is required for radioactive materials, as shown in this diagram in an example of a heavily shielded cask. What is notable here is that this material is vulnerable even during transport, as was demonstrated in the 2013 Mexico radiological theft example. And on the topic of storage and disposal, the IAEA is also helping countries develop technologies for permanent disposal of radioactive waste. This support is provided through technical guidance documents, such as these shown on the screen, which describe best practices and considerations in the development of a permanent disposal facility. The IAEA has also developed a borehole disposal system, which can be placed up to a few hundreds of meters underground. This technology will help to dispose radioactive waste and can be constructed in a short amount of time and with little infrastructure. The IAEA is currently working with Malaysia and Ghana in pilot projects in providing technical and engineering support for the construction and implementation of borehole disposal facilities for sources that are no longer in use. Near surface disposal is another option described in IAEA safety standards that have been implemented by many countries, but still in the planning and consideration phases for others. This is the process where radioactive waste is stored at or below the ground surface. The radioactive waste is placed in vaults or cells with a special bottom liner. This disposal option is implemented currently in countries like the Czech Republic, Finland, France, Japan, the UK, and the US. 
In reviewing these IAEA standards, while they are comprehensive in covering different disposal options and exploring how to fully isolate, isolate isotopes for hundreds of years, it almost seems impossible for these documents to fully cover the spectrum of all natural and technological factors that could make future disposal facilities more advanced or how countries could deal with natural changes such as soil erosion, a type of degradation that should be considered with current and future constructed disposal facilities. Many countries have also yet to explore permanent disposal and a question remains on how we account for the fact that disposal sites such as these will need to be in operation for hundreds of years. And as such, how can monitoring and information management systems be maintained when change is inevitable due to factors such as advances in technology and knowledge transfers over the years? And lastly, to summarize, Security concerns compounded with global health challenges make the use of cobalt-60 radiation therapy devices unsustainable. As such, I've provided a few of my thoughts and recommendations here on next steps to make non-source-based devices more accessible globally. The embedded issues within, with the continued use of radioactive sources in medical applications, such as cancer treatment, can have many long-term consequences especially when the intended, intended, intended use of these devices have ended. Countries are left with sources no longer in use, requiring permanent disposal, even though such facilities have yet to be considered or constructed in some countries, leaving this material vulnerable to malicious threat. Such, here are just a few of my thoughts. The squared bullets are my recommendations and the circular bullets are, are my summaries of what I think the current issues and challenges are. And that's it, thank you. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, we have about half an hour now for Q and A, if you'd like to come uh, sit okay. on the front of the table. Uh, so as per CSAC tradition, we'll give the first few questions to our current fellows. Uh, after that, open it up to anyone. If you just raise your hand at any point, uh, capture my attention, I'll put you down on a list call you in order. Uh, also, if you're attending online and have a question, feel free to enter that through the Q&A function on Zoom, and I'll pepper in some of your questions with those from uh, people in the room. Uh, when uh, Kate will bring you the mic, and please remember uh, to introduce yourself with your name and affiliation uh, before asking your questions. So now we'll go on and start with any from the fellows. Uh, hey, thanks very much for the talk. Um, my name is Ian Reynolds. I'm a fellow here at CSEC and at HAI. Um, I, I was kind of wondering, you talked a lot about these international efforts that are trying to coordinate the disposal of these materials. Do you know if states ever just kind of say, like, this is taking too long, we need to act right now, we're going to go in unilaterally and kind of provide these technologies for disposal or help with disposal? Um, I could see, for example, in the case of like, you know, the United States concerns mm -hmm. over dirty bombs or whatever, they could do something like that. So just wondering if you know of any cases in which, which that happens. Thanks. Just taking a step back in terms of the international efforts, uh, the IAEA gets involved in a lot of these types of um, disposal type considerations and concerns, mainly because that support is needed, kind of financial um, and resource constraints in these developing countries, limit countries, even though they may want to act fairly quickly, they're unable to because the, res the resource constraints are just so high. Um, so I will say, I think countries around the globe are aware and have been aware of these challenges because these materials have been used for decades. Um, and the concern was there a while ago and I think the concern just continues to grow. Um, so I think I will say that from what I'm aware of, countries are aware and they do want to act quickly. Um, organizations like the IEA come into play in terms of countries requiring some extra assistance. So they'll go to the IEA saying, hey, I need assistance with this. We know this is a priority. We know this is an issue. Um, other high-income countries, 
um, it's not always the fact that things happen multilaterally. Um, work does happen bilaterally, um, or a country can just unilaterally make the decision that yes, we will invest in this, and this is the decision that we're taking. Um, but I focused a lot on the international efforts just because the IAEA ends up being that central body that helps coordinate a lot of these activities when countries come together. Hi, Pauli. Uh, Rihanna Nielsen, uh, Cybersecurity Postdoctoral Fellow here at CSAC. Uh, please forgive me if this is a really ignorant question. Um, I was just wondering if there's any instances where states have explicitly cited the risk of terrorist activities or being stolen by violent and state armed groups as the precise reason as to why they're not providing the resources that would be helpful for, can for cancer treatment statements. It's, it's, it's almost like perverse in terms no, of going no. on. No, yeah. no, that's you. a great question. Um, I'll say yes. I mean, this is a very much so widely discussed topic in international forums. Um, I can speak from the US perspective. There are government agencies like the Department of Energy, um, the Nuclear Security, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, the Food and Drug Administration. These are all agencies and entities that are involved in talking about the risks and challenges of the use of these types of devices. Um, the National Academies of Sciences has also put out a recent follow-on report uh, on the use of cesium and cobalt um, and that was released in 2021. Um, and it talks a lot about what the issues and challenges and risks are, but they also talk about the need for governments to do more, um, invest more, to share more information. So I will say there is information sharing that's happening, but there is um, a call for more to be done, investing more and in, in putting more information out there. Okay, yeah, thanks so much, Pauli, for this um, interesting talk. One more new thing for me to worry about, okay. Um, <laughs> did you just walk, I mean, um, I don't know if I'm the only one who would need to be walked through this, but let's just say Stanford Hospital mm -hmm. is, organi is, uh, is uh, ordering a new machine. Mm -hmm. um, like who's responsible in terms of the delivery and the security and then the maintenance and then the disposal? Like how does, how does the life cycle work when a hospital orga uh, orders one of these? Um, and, and then like when they decide to order a new one, where's the old one go? Yeah, I was actually gonna ask, are you asking about ordering a machine that doesn't contain a source or a machine that does contain a source? Because the, the processes are, are slightly different. The well, I'm, I'm, I mean, it seems like I should be more worried about one that contains a source. Yeah, so I guess yeah. that's what I'm asking. Yeah, the, the source-based option, um, licensing is handled by the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, at least in the US. Um, so they're involved in that process of it. In um, addition to the actual ordering and, and doing all of that, hospitals have um, radiation protection and safety officers who manage kind of the administrative elements of that. Um, outside of the administrative elements, managing one that once that device arrives, what needs to happen, what the process needs to be in place. Um, in terms of that uh, piece of it. We also have a medical professional here, Dr. Knapp, that can also talk a little bit about it, I think as well, better than me, but from what I'm aware of, um, I've supported a US Department of Energy uh, office, the Office of Radiological Security. Um, and in terms of the disposal piece of it, um, there are US government agencies um, and laboratories that help with that assistance. So Los Alamos National Lab, um, is one of the national laboratories that manages the disposal of these types of sources. Um, and they'll take them to designated facilities that are um, located across the US for low level radioactive waste. Um, so that's one side of it, the disposal piece of it. Um, and then the actual installation of the device. Um, I'm not too familiar with the exact mechanics of who's there or, or what's happening, but I do know it needs to be in a heavily shielded kind of location in the hospital. Um, and it needs to, in many cases, be secure in that way. Um, so there needs to be some sort of shielding outside of just where the device is. So it can't just sit outside um, in an open hospital area, per se. It would need to have some shielding and some sort of wall covering for it to be located there. 
Um, but the difference is for the non-source based option, um, even though there needs to be shielding, and there aren't as many regulatory requirements, as I will say, um, in terms of the non-source based option. But you'd go through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the actual licensing piece. Yeah. Um, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it's publicly known and they're throughout the, the US. If you just search um, disposal sites uh, for radioactive waste, low level radioactive waste, you can. <laughs> so yeah, you can look it up uh, on Google. It's available publicly. Um, Los Alamos National Lab um, is the laboratory and Idaho National Lab manages those um, removal efforts in the US. Go to Luis and after that, the back of the room. Hello, this is Luis Rodriguez. I'm a postdoc fellow here. Um, my question comes a lot from the Mexican example that you bring. Like yeah. How do you convince governments to invest in actually monitoring this kind of technology long term? Mm -hmm. Because the 2013 incident was not the first time that this had happened. Yeah. Uh, the first time was in '84 in Ciudad Juarez, mm -hmm. uh, and then the Mexican government said, "Like, oh, that is a non-governed area, and it was just a low-risk incident. We don't need to pay attention to that, even though." Like there are houses that are contaminated because the whole issue got into a lot of construction material and whatever. Um, and in the 2013 incident, it was in Mexico City and the Mexican government said, like, yeah, that is in a governed area, but it's a low risk low incident. Risk. So why do we need to put up an infrastructure of monitoring and paying attention to all of this? So how do you- That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I have the answer to that. So I'll say that right off the bat. Um, I think talking about it and trying to really understand the economic consequences, I think is one surefire way of try to get, trying to get governments to understand. So I would say trying to understand what the ramifications would be. So doing an economic study of some sort, if there was to be some sort of dispersal, how far that dispersal would go um, and its economic consequences, I feel like that would be a very quick way to get someone to say, oh, this is a problem, right? Even with a bubble that might be this small, there's the chance of it growing much bigger just with exposure in general and how it works. So my thought would be going in the technical route and even suggesting doing some analytics of trying to understand what it means um, if something like this were to happen. And I will say, right, there are always going to be resource constraints. There are going to be um, officials that say there isn't enough funding or why do we need to invest in this? What, what's the purpose of it if it's a, a relatively low risk? But the consequences are high um, if it were to happen. And I think phrasing it in that way and trying to explain that the consequences could be very dire um, if there was some sort of exposure and the fact that that exposure bubble could grow um, and the implications of that, I think is one way to try and tackle that issue. Or in medical income countries that you're referring to, um, who in these countries has to make a decision to uh, secure the, the source? Uh, is it uh, the defense department? Is it the health ministry? Is it the local authorities? Like who, who is the decision maker that has to sign off and say definitely do this? It depends on the country. Um, the governing bodies could be different, but very much largely. So the Ministry of Health is very much so involved in those conversations. Um, but otherwise, there could also be second and third party organizations, just depending on the country. Um, the office that I've supported, we, we definitely work very closely with ministries of health in trying to understand um, what sources, the inventory of what's available um, in trying to understand um, you know, how to, to make changes. So we usually will work kind of at the higher levels with the ministries of health and then involve other stakeholders at the hospitals directly. Um, while the hospitals are making the decisions about, you know, the technologies and which technologies they choose to um, invest in, um, in terms of, you know, making the final decision, you're not just the hospital making the decision, it's a lot of people at the table making it. So I always like to refer to the Ministry of Health, but it's not the same in every country. The Ministry of Health could be designated as a different organization. It, it'll just depend. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, Ian's question at the very beginning, uh, he asked about whether other nations might be interested in accepting uh, used uh, sources for security reasons. 
Uh, have there also been expressions of economic interest there? I just think of in the, the mid 2010s, there was this proposal in Australia uh, to accept international shipments of nuclear, uh, spent nuclear fuel. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. idea being that many countries have spent fuel they want to get rid of. Mm -hmm. Australia has a lot of uninhabited land, so let's make money off of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like in this case, you're talking about much smaller volumes yeah. and uh, nations are already going through pretty large expenditures to purchase these things in the first place. Mm -hmm. So has any, any nation or any organization thought, well, let's accept these internationally, take them off the hands of all of these nations across the globe, trying to get rid of this stuff and make money off of that? Not that I'm aware of, um, if that is the case. So maybe just taking a step back and help me understand. So you're saying if there's one nation in particular that's saying, or one country in particular that's saying that we'll take all of these disused or sources that are no longer in use and disposing of them? Yeah, for low level waste, I mean, it's, okay. it's often a, a money making opportunity for the, the firms that operate some yeah. of these disposal facilities. That's a great question. I, have, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, usually what happens is the origin of the, the source is that's kind of where these devices will go back. So depending on the origin of where the material is coming from, the ultimate intent is either to, to dispose of it in, in that particular country or part of the world. So that happens. Um, I'm not aware if there has been uh, a country that has said we will take all of this and take care of your problem and try to, I mean, it would, it would be a great way to try and tackle it. Um, I'm just not aware if, some, if someone has said, we will take all of this material um, and put it kind of in one, in one place, um, only because I'm not sure if a country is necessarily equipped at that level to be able to dispose of that much material. In the grand scheme of things, yes, it is low level radioactive waste, um, but they tend to be you know, sources that take hundreds, if not thousands of years to decay, right? So it's not an easy task of just taking it all in and just like putting it one place. Um, but you bring up a good point of, should there be someone who centrally is trying to take care of all this? I'm not sure, actually. Australia might be an option. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they no, want to spend fuel, that's hundreds of thousands yeah. of years. This seems pretty simple. <laughs> Nuclear waste. That makes sense. And is it is it like a like a deep geological disposal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like it's like mine's already been like disposed in concrete, and like you know, there's no there's no expansion deep into the ground. Okay. We have a two finger from Scott, and then I'll do a question from the chat. Can you Cameron speak a little bit about our efforts to do this in at WIP and, and how difficult they are mm -hmm. uh, in stopping the regulations in Australia? Uh, <laughs> Just comment on question. Is the Kremlin, I thought that Mongolia was actually making some proposals, and I don't recall whether it was for high level or low level okay. waste. And Kirk and Scott here, when did our Alberta do this stuff? Okay. It was here in the, in the fall. Okay. I think Kirk told us he talked to our former member of the uh, Mongolian government. Okay. That couple who was proposing this. Oh. <laughs> In her, her, her company. I mean, it's exactly for financial yeah. reasons. Yeah. help out and, and, and we've got lots of space and we've got some money that we might use yeah. to figure out where we might put it. I, I was curious about this press you wrote your slide on terrorism. Oh, you got the mic. I don't know. I, I was um, surprised at the uh, brevity of your slide on terrorist threats, going back to uh, Al Qaeda and stuff. Have there not been more serious ones with either ISIS or or right wing terrorists in the in the last, few years? last I, few years? I know I know there's been a bit written about atomic weapon, mm -hmm. this um, neo Nazi group that has tattoos of with atomic symbols on them, and this sounds like exactly the kind of thing they they'd be interested in. I probably should have included more recent examples. I do think there there have been examples of terrorist groups expressing the fact that. They want to cause harm with a radiological dispersal device of some kind. So I will say um, I try to use historical examples, but I probably should have used more recent examples as well, um, or both. Yeah, um, that I do think that it's very much so uh, a threat today, um, as much as it was 
20, uh, 20, 30 years ago, I think that risk is still there. I think there are organizations that are well aware of how to create um, a dirty bomb and know, and know that these types of materials are very easily accessible. I think that's what makes this threat so scary. Um, hospitals and universities that do have these materials, you can walk into and you can go and there aren't necessarily any checks per se. You can walk into a hospital and you may not know exactly where a blood irradiator is or a radiation therapy device is, but a map can help you figure that out and you can go in. So I will say no, the threat is there, uh, especially the terrorist threat is there. And I think it's very much so something to be scared about even today. So this leads perfectly into a question we have uh, from our online participants where Leonard Weiss asks, and you may have just answered this, uh, he points out that there hasn't been a single significant event involving the detonation, detonation of a dirty bomb uh, containing radioactive material from one of these medical sources. Uh, so he asks why you think that is and whether the risk of this might have been hype. I hear both sides of that. Um, and he brings up a good point. Um, and I think it also ties into what Louise was saying about how do you get governments or people to buy into this idea if there hasn't been um, any sort of large scale activity. And I think that's in large part, um, at least in the United States, a lot of devices have already been um, switched over in terms of technologies, or the current technologies that are source based are heavily protected with physical security enhancements, and they have um, capabilities of being protected in that regard. Um, so I think in the, the US especially, uh, a lot of hospitals and universities are already making that transition to non-source-based technologies. Um, so the actual availability of that material, I would say is, is more limited, at least here. So there hasn't been that case. If you look globally too, I think that's where I see a lot of threat as well, just because so much of that material is widespread. Um, and the point I try to make is, Yes, there hasn't been any sort of attack or anything that's happened um, with this type of material, but you consider the fact that if it were to happen, the consequences would be very high. Um, the, the fear, the panic, the mass disruption, and just exposure in general, um, and the impacts that that could be felt for, for years. Um, so I think about it in that regard that, yes, um, you know, it hasn't happened low kind of risk of that happening, but the consequences are very, very high for those effects. And you had this quote also uh, about half the world yeah. should have access yeah. to this. So yeah. presumably, if that were to occur, then yeah. the risk would scale with yeah. the distribution geographically, at least. Yeah, exactly. Good point. Yeah. I'll go to, uh, we'll do a two finger, then Harold over here. Hmm. non-state actors or, or you know, whoever they are, are have not, I just haven't, it hasn't been on their mind that they want to do this. Are they, I mean, if they do see an example of it happening, they can just go crazy all over the world? Or is it that there are some barriers that are keeping them from doing this that are fortunately in place that, that are going to prevent them from doing that? Yeah, I would say there are um, definitely, if you, if you Google and look online, there are examples of people trying to, to get access or trying to insiders um, that have attempted to access this type of material. Um, I will say there are barriers in place. Um, so um, US, the US Department of Energy, they have the Office of Radiological Security, where one of their mission areas is to provide security enhancements to devices like this um, in the US and also internationally in providing those types of barriers. Um, so th those um, are definitely kind of delaying factors in terms of someone attempting to try and, and kind of grab that material if, if they do so. So I will say there are procedures and um, enhancements in place. Outside the US as well? Yes, outside the US, US as well. So I will say a lot of those um, devices will have physical security enhancements, as we call them, um, that are around the, the area of the machine. Um, so you can also have access, like biometric access readers and things that kind of help provide second and third layer protection efforts um, for protecting those devices. Harold, go ahead. Thanks, Malavi, for this talk. Um, I was curious, at, at some point in the talk, I think you gave um, numbers on the on the number of source-based devices that are in operation around the world. Yeah. What was the scale of that? So. 
Um, a medical uh, physics international journal article, it was from 2020, and it had cited that there were 1,766 cobalt teletherapy units in use worldwide, um, but that 86% of those devices were located in uh, low to middle income countries. And so a good chunk of them in, in LMIC. So it, it strikes me that that's a scale where you could imagine like some sort of buyback program mm -hmm. for these devices. Like if you're worried about the end, you know, in return for you agreeing to take certain measures to track the devices, we'll buy it back from you at the end of life. Mm -hmm. This may connect to sort of Cameron's proposal or, or uh, uh, on, uh, on this, where it, that strikes me as being on the range of something that could, the United States could just decide to buy back if you're worried about these things. Uh, and that's really not that scary, but it's not all the way to the Right, that's so true. Any discussion in US circles about just doing that? Uh, because I know that, for example, not the case of Mill as well, sort of post Soviet Union, US working with, with um, Russia on the security of nuclear materials, and, and you know, there's always a major effort there. And I wonder if there's some lessons to be learned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, that's a good point. And I think there is such a range of disposal options that are on the table, um, at least. So I mentioned there are short term, short term storage options, but right, that in essence is awaiting permanent disposal, right? So you're kind of in a, um, in a place where it's not being permanently disposed, at least not immediately. Um, there are also return to supplier options. So I would say um, if if the supplier of, of the device is able to take that back, right? That's also another scenario of being able to kind of take that off your hands. Um, but you make a good point. Should there be a centralized concerted effort of, for example, the US taking back all this material um, and having it disposed of? Um, I mean, I think those conversations are happening. Um, I just don't know how quickly or what, you know, how quickly something like that could happen of having a buyback program in essence um, of, of taking all of that, that back. That's a good comparison you raised though, because there was this huge US effort for uh, nuclear materials used to power lighthouses mm. uh, along the Northern coast of Russia. And um, Sig Hecker, who unfortunately isn't here, was a, at CSAC was a huge expert on that issue. And it seemed like massive expenditure that the US was willing to put into that. So it does seem a little odd that, that for this, with the risks you've, you've raised, uh, it doesn't seem to have that much attention at this point in time. I'll say, I mean, I think it has attention from the US in the regard um, of if there is a security implication, right? I think the US, the office that I, I support, the Office of Radiological Security, they do help with disposal options with, um, with sources when you know countries are done with their intended use of the source. But there needs to be kind of a specific security emphasis on that. So meaning that it is being disposed of um, and it is being taken somewhere. Versus, you know, there are other options such as return to supplier, as I mentioned, recycling. Um, and those options, you know, are challenging because if you're recycling a source, right, you're in essence just putting it back on the market or being able to have that option of being it, have it be put back on the market. So it's just, I think there are a lot of considerations. I'll just say disposal is complicated in that regard. I think the US um, is involved in those conversations and even a part of a lot of disposal efforts, but there are a lot of different pathways. Um, and I think when you try to explore all of the pathways, I don't know how involved the US can be in all of the pathways. So my question about it. Thank you very much. We have that mic. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, overview. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Daniel Kapp, uh, been a radiation oncologist at Stanford for too many years to mention. Uh, we never had a cobalt at Stanford. Uh, Henry Kaplan helped design the first medical linear accelerator, now in the Smithsonian, uh, that was used at Stanford in the early 1960s, so it wasn't a problem. Uh, nuclear medicine has radioactive isotopes, mm -hmm. And their approach is to develop them all in-house. So we have a cyclotron over at the medical center, and there's going to be a new cyclotron being built, probably ready within a year on Porter Drive. So for the short half-life, minimum transportation, uh, and they have a short half-life, so you don't have to worry about long-term effects. So that's the local approach to this huge problem. Uh, 
in terms of nations dealing with it, I think the International Atomic Energy Commission being commissioned and being located in Vienna, Austria, is getting a little biased view because Austria is a non-nuclear proliferation zone. It does not permit the transport of radioactive materials. So that ends the problem. You want to have an isotope that's developed where you're going to use it. It doesn't have cobalt units. The only country that built a nuclear reactor never commissioned it. It doesn't get nuclear power from its reactor because they're so concerned. And then the Chernobyl fallout that all blew over Austria made them even more aware. So different countries have taken more or less very divergent views on how to handle this. Uh, price of linear accelerator, I wish they were under 2 million. The new ones that we've been purchasing are between 3 and 5 million. That's not where it stops. The proton beam machines are 10 times that. The shielding goes up, not because of the energy per se, but once you get past 10 MeV beams, you have neutron contamination. So you have an additional shielding problem and you have wide walk-in ways to cut down the exposure to neutrons in, in the room. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's very complex. There are agencies that have to approve every step of the way from the hospital uh, to, uh, there used to be utilization committees, they don't exist anymore, to stop the proliferation of nuclear accelerate, nuclear uh, uh, clinic, clinical devices Every community wanted its own accelerator, et cetera. So it's a complex issue. I'm, I'm glad the international community is dealing with it, but I said that 20 years ago, and it's very disappointing uh, to see how little progress we made. Uh, I've consulted in countries that, boy, you wish they didn't have cobalt, like Venezuela. Yeah. Venezuela was a up and coming democracy sort of 30 years ago when I spent several summers there, but now you're glad they don't have much radioactive material around because of great risk. So glad work is being done. I hope the world community comes together to do something about it. One of the concerns with the Ukrainian-Russian war was that Russia was going to use a nuclear tactical weapon, which could be something like a dirty bomb, yeah. which by itself won't cause that much damage, but will scare the hell out of people and cause pandemonium. So yeah. these are real issues, and I'm, I'm glad the International Committee is re-exploring it. Interest in it. Very much needed, very worthwhile treatment for cancer, and we need it where they can afford it the least. Thank you. Thank you. Given the production of these, uh, do you expect that economies of scale would be realized as uh, the use of source-based technologies becomes more widespread and so sources might get cheaper if you have reactors dedicated to the production of them, for example? Mm. They may. I mean, it's a good point. I mean, sources to begin with are, when you compare them to the non-source-based option, are much cheaper. And that's mainly why uh, a lot of countries have chosen to go with source-based technologies versus the non-source-based. Um, I'm not sure. I think that's a that's a great point. Um, if if that's something that could potentially be on the table, but I think the the risks associated with it are just so high, and it just feels like the opposite should happen of non-source-based technology device manufacturers trying to find ways to decrease those equipment costs and maintenance costs. Um, so my hope is that that happens more so on the non-source based side, because I think those devices are advanced in many ways. And I think if those were cheaper um, and could be sustainable in more low resource environments where there may be constraints with power, um, that if there are ways to make those machines sustainable there, then that would be a much better kind of act versus trying to get the source based option. Just to, to, you remind me of something else that would be a nice addendum to, to what you're doing here, which is in the late summer, early fall, the Russian government claimed that the Ukrainians were preparing dirty bombs for use against the Russians. And here the IAE, and people were concerned, um, A, it was an effort to try to reduce support for Ukraine, and B, it was potentially a false flag operation in case they wanted to do something themselves. Mm -hmm. But here the IAEA went into Ukraine and investigated all the sources 
and then publicly said, we see no evidence that there's any malfeasance or any theft going on. So there's no evidence of this whatsoever. That's a really interesting and new uh, use of the IAEA, you know, going into a war-torn country and providing a different kind of inspection than they've ever right. done before, right in the area that you're yeah. learning about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we're just about at the end of the session. Uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. And thanks to everyone who attended online and in person.